Thanks for inviting me to come here. It's uh, good to see some, some old friends and meet some new ones. Uh, I'd like to start off with a few commercials that help pay the bills. My, my publishers would never forgive me if I didn't mention first my book, now available on Kindle for you e-readers out there. Uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about this morning uh, are, are uh, recounted in here, recorded here in greater detail. This was about my experience as NASA's first Mars czar, um, although I went on after that to uh, finish my career with NASA's director of NASA Ames uh, in California. The other thing I want to draw in the field is science and technology, engineering, and so forth. And then finally, uh, I would guess from the discussions yesterday that there are a lot of people here who would see this last reason and put it first, a second home for humanity, colonizing Mars. And that's a theme that I've heard here over the last day and a half. So the question that I pose to myself is which of these pieces, of these six, are necessary for affording the exploration of Mars in the, in the future? And I would argue all of them. All of these reasons are necessary and they all will be part of the story that we as a community have to put together to encourage and stimulate uh, humans to Mars in the, in the 2030s. So let me explain what these elements are. Clarity. I think it's essential that agencies and communities, and I'll speak a lot about NASA because it's like the old Willie Sutton joke, you know, who was a bank robber, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. You know, NASA still has the world's largest space exploration budget. And so I will speak uh, a fair amount about what they can do. But I think uh, clarity of purpose and uh, a very simple statement of what we're trying to do is necessary. I do believe in independent assessments. I've seen that time and again over the last 40 years of my career because advocates are optimists, and you need the skeptic to come in and say, you know, you're really missing this issue here. And then somebody has to be in charge. Let me ask you today, who is in charge of getting humans to Mars by 2030? No one. So, <laughs> so somebody's got to be leading this charge. I mean, uh, Bill Gerstenmeyer, who's the, the NASA A Associate Administrator for Human Space Flight, is a wonderful person, a more dedicated individual you will not find. But he's got front and center in his face funding and supporting space station and commercial cargo and commercial crew. He's got a whole pot full of hot items. And he doesn't necessarily have time to think about this 20-year structure into the future. So I think somebody needs to be in charge. Now, coalition and convergence. There are multiple communities that to make this happen have to come together. People that have been traditional competitors <clears throat> have to be one of three ways of working together. You know, there's, in, in terms of greater and greater involvement, there's coordination. Hey, I've got some data. I've got some data. Let's compare our data. There's collaboration. You're going to Mars. I've got a payload here. Take my payload to Mars. And then there's interdependence. I've got the card, you've got the horse, we can't get there unless we work together and are interdependent. So we need to have this type of involvement by multiple groups. And international partnerships need to be incorporated into this, despite the current worldwide tensions. Um, and I think they can in fact, end up with a uh, peaceful outcome. And then finally, commerce. I do personally, this is all my personal opinion, not think the future exploration of the solar system and exploration of Mars in particular will be sustainable without a trailing edge business ecosystem. I think that there has to be economic development and we have to engage the entrepreneurs who are already part of the, the community. So let's talk about clarity of purpose. And again, I'm going to speak about NASA a great deal. So like any government bureaucracy, uh, that has now been around for 50 years. It has a relatively vague, what I call Christmas tree, mission and vision statement. And this comes about, uh, there are people in the audience here who, I was part of NASA for 20 years, or people here were probably, um, how long were you with NASA? 40 years, okay. And what you see over that time is that when you construct these mission and vision statements, 
Uh, everybody wants to see their ornament on the tree. <laughs> what about me? I've got to have a word in there. So here's two current uh, statements out of NASA's official website. To reach new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all mankind. No, that's okay. It's a lot of words. Or pioneer the future in space exploration, scientific discovery, and aeronautics research. That's almost everything in the kitchen sink. Um, so I would propose that NASA have a three-word mission statement. Explore deep space. That's all there is. Okay? Just do that. So if you do that, you can derive what is the most important thing in your portfolio or the most important things. You start with this, three words, explore deep space, and then the human priority becomes humans to Mars, 2033. 30s. It means the top science priorities, planetary science and astrophysics, and explore deep space, and the technology and the aeronautics. We've got to go hypersonic, we've got to go through atmospheres to support the above. So while I, I don't know if this would ever turn out exactly like this, I think clarity of purpose is essential if you're going to go after something as ambitious as, as humans to Mars in the 2030s. We also have to be clear about the budget landscape and what's doable and what isn't doable. Uh, many of you have probably seen this. Uh, some people call it the Washington Monument budget uh, profile. And this is NASA's budget from the very beginning to just a couple of years ago. You see the big spike where it went up to 4% of the federal budget. That was the Mercury Gemini Apollo era. Then it declined. By about 1975, it was at the 1% level, and it's gone up and down. There was a small spike in here where, um, where they replaced the Challenger shot um, right there with Atlantis. Uh, but otherwise, it's continued down more or less to where it is today, about a half a percent. Now, every time I've shown this chart to uh, technical, scientific, other audiences, there's usually somebody that says, yeah, but, you know, the whole federal budget's been going up, and, you know, this is misleading, so I redid it as constant year dollars. And what you see is roughly the same profile. There's uh, still a big spike in the Apollo era, where NASA's budget in 2007 dollars would be about 32, 33 billion dollars a single year. And this is the replacement of the shuttle out here. So if you take the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo era here, and you look at the last 10 years out here, and say to duplicate the Apollo era funding, what would NASA's budget need to be? It would need to be about 24 billion a year, or six billion a year more than it's getting today. Ain't gonna happen. Not in this environment, maybe not ever. So we have to say, let's be realistic about what the budget is and is likely to be. <clears throat> Let's also talk about the difference in scope. People like to invoke the Apollo era and say, if we could just get back to that. Well, it's not only the dollars, which I think will never be repeated, but the scope was different. In that era, up to 70% of NASA's budget was going into that single focus program. Today, this is what it looks like. Uh, NASA's budget is Maybe not a basket of pebbles, but it serves many constituencies. Uh, if you add up the exploration budget and the space station budget, call that the budget that would be utilized for future human exploration, it's about 44%. Now, if you say that we're going to have humans on Mars by the 2030s, that means you've got $160 billion to play with. That's a lot of money. And I think what, as a community and, and what the government and what everybody who's interested in this needs to do is to be certain that when we get to the 2030s, 2033, that we look back and say, we have spent $160 billion wisely. We haven't gotten to 2033, and we're no further than we are today. That would be a crime and a tragedy. So while this portfolio may need to be revisited in the future, let's just remember that $160 billion figure. 
I think we also can learn from what happened with the robotic Mars exploration program. Uh, I came in at Van Golden's request, took over the program in early 2000, after two missions disappeared, Mars Polar Lander, Mars Climate Orbiter, and at that point there was not a real program, at least not in my opinion. There was a line item in the budget, and there was a directive to fly an orbiter and a lander at every opportunity, but no particular other structure to it. So we put together, <coughs> the team and myself, a a interdependent program, a coupled program of mission pieces and an investment in technology where one mission led to the other and built on each other. Uh, <clears throat> we had a central theme we called Follow the Water. Uh, we had a major question, the first among equals, did life ever arise? Uh, and we had a single person in charge, and at the headquarters that happened to be me, uh, and a single person in charge at JPL. And it's been extremely successful uh, since that restructuring. Uh, the U.S. program has had full success from all the missions, Mars Odyssey, the Twin Rovers, Reconnaissance Orbiter, Phoenix, uh, and now uh, Curiosity. Now, to do this kind of restructuring, I needed to invent something that didn't quite exist. There are probably many people here in the room who know what systems engineering is. It's the glue that holds together a project. It's how the piece parts work together. The avionics uh, talks to the power system, and the power system talks to the various actuators and so forth. Um, and what we did was to take that notion and move it up a level to a program consisting of a decade's worth of missions. And we traded off the science requirements, the technology readiness, and all the programmatics, the launch date, the launch vehicle, the amount of money, the schedule, and kept trading those against each other until we reached a mission queue that's the one that you see today that was the optimum that we could achieve within all those constraints. So I think something like this, where we replace the science goal <coughs> with the exploration goal, needs to be done. And I know that there are many, 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 many trade studies done for a human exploration of Mars over the last 40 years. And my suggestion would be uh, take those trade studies, incorporate the uh, program systems engineering concept, and let's see if we can't come up with a, a plausible mission queue. <clears throat> now, moving to coalition and convergence for human spaceflight, I think it's important that we have cost caps. The science community has learned how to live with this make it work. Uh, there's no reason this has to be any different. A lot of debate about an asteroid mission, a moon mission, that has to be decided on uh, the cost and the enabling requirements. And early non-advocate independent assessments of whatever is presented, in my view, are absolutely necessary. And we need to know that, at least currently, a coalition of JPL, Langley, Ames, and industry is the only group that can put a metric ton on the surface of Mars. So working across the organizations within NASA, again, I'm speaking uh, to NASA primarily because that's where the money is, um, okay, um, is absolutely necessary. Uh, within the agency, as within many large bureaucracies, there tends to be stovepiping and <coughs> protection and so forth. Working across the organizations is absolutely critical. Now, to move on to a topic <coughs> that came up in last night's panel, I, know we're, uh, I think some of you were here for that discussion, which was very, very lively. Uh, where is the intersection between human spaceflight and the science community? I think there is one, and I think it's already been identified. And with proper leadership by both communities, I think we can come together converge and have a stronger whole program. Uh, way back in 2000, uh, I presented to uh, the administrator and the associate administrator my view of where the convergence was between what was then called HEADS, the Human Exploration and Development of Space, and the Office of Space Science Needs. And we started out here. Uh, Fifteen years later, 
uh, one of my successors, Orlando Figueroa, who had much better graphics produced the same picture. <laughs> but it's essentially the same story. It's saying there is a place where scientific <coughs> goals and human exploration goals and technology contributions do converge. And we need to identify this point and work on that if we're going to have a, an integrated program going forward. I will also point to something I mentioned last night, which is the National Academy of Science Planetary Decadal Survey. In there, there was a chapter <coughs> that was drafted by somebody I know well, <laughs> uh, but it survived peer review, and I want to point to this one sentence here. If humans are going to visit these bodies, collecting and returning high-quality samples are among the most scientifically important things they can do. So that's the hook. If we're having humans at Mars, then they, a well-trained astrobiologist or Mars scientist, is capable of identifying in a few minutes samples that are of extreme value that take our rovers today as capable as they are, <coughs> days, even months, to do. So this is where the two communities can come together. The ISS. Uh, is the place to do the microgravity studies of long duration spaceflight. I think there's been a lot of progress in countermeasures. The space medicine community may not be able to say exactly how it works at the detailed cellular level, but I have a lot of, uh, of friends in the astronaut corps, past and, and present, who have been on a six month tour, and uh, they say the countermeasures that have come up with work pretty well. So I think the six-month flight that, that Bob Zubrin has talked about is something that we have a lot more knowledge today about how to deal with it than we did 20 years ago. Now, is there something that uh, uh, somebody has termed Sutter's gold in space? I don't know. There's tantalizing hints. I'll tell you where this, this term came from, um, and it's Bob Walker's term. Uh, Bob was the chair of the House uh, Science Committee for and um, he kept asking this question, where is the thing? You know, Sutter's Gold up in Northern California was the one that drew all of these young entrepreneurs, the, the people building businesses, searching for gold, that eventually built San Francisco and much of Northern California uh, because they were searching for the gold. Is there that same breakthrough from science on the International Space Station? I put a couple of examples of hints here, uh, but I think it's critical if the space station is going to be considered to be a success that we find whether or not there is something that is truly a breakthrough from knowledge of microgravity. Now, return on investment. Uh, like I said, speak to the hard-nosed business people. They want to know, uh, is there money in, in space? Uh, and, oh, by the way, what's the space program done for the economy anyway? And I always point out that we do not fear, uh, fill the fairing of a Falcon 9 with dollar bills and fire it in space. <laughs> that money is spent here on Earth in very good high-tech jobs across the nation. It is a difficult thing to determine return on investment for something like a government program like NASA or the space program. <clears throat> There have been attempts to do it. The most conservative ones come up with about a two to one return on investment in new goods and services. If that's correct, that's very good. Uh, and some would say very, very good for a government program. Okay, let's turn to the final piece of my uh, talk this morning, which is commerce. The world space economy today is uh, probably, this number is probably now about $300 billion. That's how much money is in uh, the space business worldwide. And of course, in 1958, that was 100% government. Today, only 30% of that $300 billion is <coughs> government spending. 70% is in commercial space and supporting activities. And that's primarily in the communications, space communications where I am at Stanford in Palo Alto, just down the street, is a company called Space Systems Loral. They are the world's largest manufacturer of communication 
satellites, and they've got a factory that at any given time, there are six commsats in various stages of development. And this is the core of this uh, seven to $300 billion industry, of which $200 billion is in commercial space. So this has existed for a long time. You could argue that Telstar in 1962 was the beginning of, of commercial space. Um, Norm Augustine, who was the, uh, uh, the head of uh, Martin Marietta at the merge of Lockheed <coughs> and Martin Marietta, uh, was asked to do a review um, in the first term of uh, President Obama. He came and said, uh, well, in having a new human spaceflight program worthy of a great nation, we need to look at what's happening in the commercial sector because there's opportunity there to reduce cost to the government. <clears throat> and as you know, there was already a program started by my friend and colleague, my over here, uh, the COTS program, I like, uh, that was investing in developing capabilities for commercial space. And then in 2010, uh, the Constellation program, based on the Augustine report, was terminated and the investment in replacing the shuttle with commercial cargo and commercial crew took place. Um, since that time, there has been a little more mutation of the landscape with the uh, introduction, some would say reintroduction of the Space Launch System in Orion, but the funding for uh, commercial cargo uh, is solid. That's happening, uh, as you know. Uh, SpaceX with their Dragon and Falcon 9 has delivered uh, fully paid for commercial flights to the station. Orbital Sciences has done the same uh, with their Cygnus and Antares launch vehicles. So that is happening, and I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, there is a hugely intense competition for commercial crew, <coughs> primarily among uh, Boeing, uh, Sierra, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and SpaceX. This is just a little cut off the bottom here, but uh, that's the third competitor. They are promising a down select soon, August, September, so we'll see which of these competitors will be taking astronauts to the space station. And most people in this room, I think, would know that uh, suborbital tourism has gone from being a dream to being a near reality uh, between Virgin Galactic and X Core. So why do we care about this? I think we care about this, first of all, because it lowers the cost to get to LEO. You have co-investment, you have skin in the game. Uh, depending on uh, which source you read, uh, SpaceX uh, has put in between $50 million and $300 million of their own money. Um, others are putting profit and in internal R&D money in as well. <coughs> Elon Musk has announced he's going to retire on Mars. And of course, we have Boss Lonsdorf, I don't know if he's here or not, uh, who started the Mars One uh, enterprise. There is a key technology that SpaceX is investing in. One way to get uh, large payloads to the surface of Mars is using a technique that has not been yet fully proven called supersonic retropropulsion. Uh, Elon is collecting data on this. Uh, as his cargo flights uh, re-enter the atmosphere. And this, I think, these two programs, plus suborbital tourism, are having a strong effect on public engagement. I can tell you that my students, if you say, which would you rather work for, Boeing or SpaceX, they're headed down to Hawthorne. They want to work for that. And if you go down to that place, you feel the buzz. It feels like the old days. <laughs> I mean, the place is just alive with energy. And there's senior people with all battle scars as well as the young folks that uh, don't know anything is impossible. Uh, and I think that's really, really exciting. The other point I want to make is that the people who are going to take these suborbital flights uh, are not your highly selected and trained uh, crew, uh, astronaut crew. They are people, senior people, let us call them, since I entered that category in December <laughs> uh, of uh, 65 and above, but of high net worth. And uh, they're engaged in this. And one of the critical 
questions that's being answered by an FAA program. As the FAA is the ones in charge of all commercial flights, certifying and licensing and permitting. And so the question is, let's say you're 80 years old, you have a pacemaker, controlled hypertension, and a hip replacement. Is it okay for you to go to the edge of space for four minutes of weightlessness? Turns out, uh, my friend and colleague Jim Vanderplow, uh, who's a, a flight surgeon, a space doc at the uh, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, has just completed a four-year study, centrifuge tests, and it looks like almost anybody can take one of these suborbital flights and not have adverse physical reactions to that. So all the people out there who are currently on Medicare, it's okay. <laughs> we can go. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, another uh, former astronaut colleague of mine who uh, just retired from Boeing about a year or so ago, Brewster Shaw, uh, oh, I arranged an interview with my students for him. We were working on a topic of commercial space and, and uh, what he uh, thought of it. And in the beginning of the interview, Brewster, and he knows I've told the story, so I'm not speaking out of school here, uh, was sort of uh, negative, quite conservative, let's say, <clears throat> that the new companies didn't know what they didn't know and that there would be a lot of problems and so on. But then one of the students said, well, but what about being in space? And Brewster changed immediately. So oh, you cannot imagine what it's like to be in space. You have to look down at the Earth, look at the dark sky and see the stars. And, and then he reflected for a minute. And he said, you know, the more people that go, the more we will want to go. <laughs> so I think the suborbital tourism, while it looks like joy rides for millionaires, will have an effect of building the ecosystem of enthusiasm about being in space. I, I think this is going to be an un, maybe unheralded uh, side effect. Anyhow, I said, let's harness all this energy and use it for our future. So a uh, little final bit of suggestions here. Um, the Mars program structure that I set in place 10 years ago uh, has arguably worked very well. Uh, that success was having a good team, a good plan, fit the budget, and relentless sales. Uh, I'll be very clear with you that I wore out numerous pairs of shoes going to see the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Office of Management and Budget, the House Science uh, Majority and Ranking Leaders, the Senate Appropriations and Senate Authorization, and all these people. And this is how you make a program that involves government funding work. If this could all be done by private funds, then you know that's a whole different story. But I suspect as we go forward to the 2030s with uh, plan for humans in space and humans at Mars, it will involve NASA. And so this structure here, as complicated as it is, is something that has to be dealt with. So, uh, if you're involved in this program on any way touching government or advocacy, just remember you've got to get out there and sell it. And you have to be positive. You have to point out the benefits. You have to derive, use one of those six reasons, depending on your audience. Uh, the good news is even in this hyper-polarized environment, I've found space to be uh, these days certainly bipartisan and often nonpartisan. Uh, and so both sides of the aisle have helped, for example, plus up the planetary science mm -hmm. budget. So in conclusion, uh, we know that today Mars, at least on the surface, is dry and, and cold and forbidding. We know that in the past there was a huge amount of surface water available. Uh, could it be, in the future, our, our second home for humanity? Well, I think we can do this. Thank you. So, uh, I think we've left uh, plenty of time for questions. Yes, sir?
Right, so the question is, I mentioned the countermeasures that have been developed for extended stays uh, in, uh, on the space station, uh, but what about a tethered spacecraft? <clears throat> and studies of artificial gravity have been carried out for decades. Uh, they have some appealing features. Uh, the only issue I would raise is that it is another system. Anytime you have to develop another hardware system, that adds to the cost. So if it is possible that the exercise and all of the things that, that are done, uh, principally exercise related things, cardiovascular uh, uh, techniques, um, really do result in the ability to arrive at Mars after six months in pretty good shape, and you don't have to build a second mechanical electromechanical system, then you save money. Uh, and I think that's that's the way I see it. Bill. One of the uh, books that many of us have read is called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Jared Dyke. It's about a group of people who have uh, developed immunity, or semi-immunity, a lot of different germs. They go to a group that has not got immunity and just about destroy this group. We are talking about going to Mars. If we were to destroy any life that was there, a planet worth of life, that would be a tragedy beyond description. How are we guaranteeing that we will not do that? Yes, so Bill's question is about what would happen, hypothetically, if we brought, as the Europeans brought to the Native Americans of the New World, diseases to the planet Mars or some type of microbe that we to us is benign, but it managed to wipe out an ecosystem that currently exists on Mars. And this, I agree, would be a tragedy. Uh, last night, uh, Bob uh, and I had a spirited discussion uh, about the whole issue of planetary protection. So there is currently a, a, a treaty level agreement among spacefaring nations that uh, we will not contaminate the, the other worlds and we will not allow them to contaminate us. Uh, people have criticized this, uh, among them for being at the moment overly restrictive. Bill Peruki brings up the counterpoint of what if we wiped out an entire Martian ecosystem by just uh, ignorance or taking something there that, that we don't understand or that we think is benign. Um, where I think uh, right now it is my belief, uh, based on a study I was part of, that NASA is undertaking a very significant review of the whole planetary protection implementation uh, system, the, the so-called planetary protection office. Uh, because this as we get closer to humans on Mars, this issue will become more and more present. Uh, one option that has been discussed is the possibility of the first Mars astronauts <clears throat> being in orbit for at least a while, teleoperating rovers that have been sterilized to current, current standards, uh, and that do not put our boots on the ground until we are relatively sure, or very sure, about what might happen and what we might take there. Uh, Viking, uh, unlike more recent missions, uh, Viking probably had 20, 25% of its total budget spent one way or another on sterilization and planetary protection. Uh, since that time, we've learned a lot more about surface Mars and how uh, much it probably does not support uh, microbial life on the surface. So um, all I can say is, Bill, a point well taken, and uh, that there will be a lot more of, uh, evaluation of what we do. We know, I mean, there's more, on your, the film on your teeth has more bugs in it than there are cells in your body. So uh, it's something we have to do to consider. Yes, sir. Yeah, I thank you very much for your support for supersonic retropropulsion. It's absolutely necessary, as far as I can see, to land humans and heavy cargo on Mars. So, but of course, 
some of the most recent uh, National Science Foundation reports have denigrated, put the priority for testing supersonic radio propulsion at a much lower level than some of the other technologies like, like balloons and hypercollins, which are expendable devices, whereas the SRP, is, as part of the vehicle, is, is, yeah, is reusable. So how can we get some relatively inexpensive, like five or ten million dollar sounding rocket test done to prove the validity of that at the speeds and density that's in the, in the Martian atmosphere, but in using the Earth's atmosphere as a test bed? Yeah, so the question is about the um, real value of supersonic retro propulsion. Uh, the, the, uh, the speaker uh, said that it is uh, something that really should have a high priority. I agree with that. There's a lot of testing of balloons and other types of things for it to send landing. Um, what I can say is that this was brought to my attention a couple of years ago uh, with an initiative that uh, partly was a collaboration of uh, SpaceX and NASA Ames called Red Dragon. Uh, and the idea was predicated on SRP. I'll just use that as the shorthand for supersonic retro propulsion because that's hard to say. So, SRP as an enabling feature. And uh, as a result of this, uh, I brought a group of the world's leading entry, descent, and landing specialists uh, down to SpaceX. Uh, Elon joined us for two hours, and we had a thorough engineering discussion, technical discussion, no, no politics or budgets. And uh, what Elon and his team agreed was that the tests that had been done in the 50s and 60s were gave good hints, but they were not sufficient. And what really needed to happen to validate the codes, I mean, you can now run computational fluid dynamics that shows this should work, it should work quite well. Uh, but you need the validation. Uh, and that resulted in a workshop at Georgia Tech hosted by Bobby Braun, uh, well known in the field. Uh, and out of that came a white paper uh, and a set of recommendations. And what I can say, the good news is that the Space Technology Director and people at NASA headquarters are taking this seriously. They have, uh, as I mentioned, Elon is uh, on his <coughs> re entry, the legged re entry. Uh, is collecting SRP data. That data is now part of an agreement with NASA to be shared. And so there is a growing recognition that uh, that SRP is something that the, the agency needs to invest in. It'll probably take a little more prodding. And those of you who are in technical fields, uh, don't be shy about sending a note to Bobby Braun or to Jim Green at NASA headquarters, letting them know that, that you see this as being important for the following well substantiated technical reasons. So, good question. Yes, sir, over here. Uh, question, have you ever considered using, because you, the asteroid redirect mission today and the is good and is bad to investing in this mission. Have you ever considered using that mission as a way to pull and profit the bankroll of our mission? Uh, so the question, I think, is could you generate a profit out of the asteroid redirect mission? Uh, are you saying by cut by? By selling yeah. platinum or something, or yeah, find, find an asteroid that has minerals on it that are worth selling. Uh, you know, I've looked at the uh, the business case for some of these things, and frankly, I'm not convinced. <laughs> uh, but what I since since uh, if you go on the journal and get signed in for your free 30 days, you can go to the issue, which I think was the uh, second or third issue last year that we devoted the round table and a, a number of papers to this discussion. So you can read for yourself what the advocates say and what the skeptics say. And uh, I would say it's, uh, it's uh, TBD, stay tuned. I, I don't think the business case closes, but uh, the advocates are out there claiming that they have a, have a plan. Bob? What's your view of the asteroid retrieval mission? So what's my view of ARM, the asteroid redirect mission? Uh, I'm a skeptic. Uh, the uh, mission, uh, as it's currently designed or, or presented, um, has a number of technical features in it that I find quite daunting. Uh, but if you just go to the bottom line, I do not personally believe the $1.2 billion 
dollar price tag. Uh, I think that it is much, much more than that. So I would urge NASA, before they make a down, you know, right now they're saying they're going to down select between option A and option B. One is to snare uh, an asteroid and bring back the others to go to a much larger one and grab a piece of rubble and bring that back. Um, the uh, uh, ARM mission was predicated on a piece of, of information that is not correct, that there are no near-Earth objects that you can reach uh, with a reach reasonable launch energy, and that's simply not true. Uh, Rick Benzel, who's a well-known uh, professor at MIT, who works in the area of near-Earth objects, sent in a uh, quite harsh letter to the NRC uh, people pointing out the launch energies of several Near-Earth objects that you could reach, uh, probably with uh, you know a, maybe even a current launch vehicle. So um, my my suggestion is uh, cost this thing, find out what we're what the nation is planning to do. Uh, I think you need to have an independent technical review as well. I find the whole idea of trying to snare a tumbling, rotating, 500-ton object. He's scary, um, <laughs> but uh, um, and I do see value in conducting some human operations in in deep space. Maybe there is a near Earth object you can get to in the, in the near term. Um, but I, I'd say I'm skeptical about ARM. Yes, sir. Set aside the question of ARM. Are asteroids in general any useful stepping stone? I think there's a plausibility argument for that. Uh, if you could reach one in its native orbit, uh, I don't think you'd have to go to bringing the piece back to. A, you see, the whole thing is about extra gravity wells and funding, right? So the reason, if you invoke the moon as the stepping stone to go to Mars, the price tag goes up significantly, is because you have to design a lander that won't be the same lander you would use on Mars, and that increases the price tag significantly. The asteroid came in as an intermediate stepping stone uh, because it doesn't have a gravity well to speak of, and you wouldn't have to design a second lander, and you could therefore keep the price uh, at a reasonable level um, for the whole for the end-to-end -end game of getting humans <coughs> to Mars. Uh, now, you know, since, since Bob's the founder of this society, I will give a strong nod to uh, his first book and Mars Direct. Um, uh, you know, I think some of the issues that I had with that uh, idea. When did, when did what you publish that? From? The first edition, 1996. 1996. So uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, Bob's book was published, and I think some of the issues of uh, crew health and safety. Um, we've got recent data that's retired some of that. Some of that is. Um, we probably still don't see eye to eye on some of the other technical aspects. So at this moment. I would support the notion of visiting a near-Earth object as an interim step, uh, but only as a part of an integrated Mars program that's been engineered to where we know how to get to that end piece. Yes, sir? Yeah. You mentioned the idea of cell, cell, cell to Washington, D.C., just what it's about. But the public person is to be controlled by public perception. Have you any suggestions on how to sell, sell, sell to the public general? Yeah, a, a couple of suggestions. Uh, one is I think there are going to be, and, and by the way, I think uh, given the timekeeper back here, this has to be the last question. Um, there are some uh, what I believe is unanticipated side effects of things like space tourism where people will start talking to their friends who talk to their friends, and these are people of high net worth who move in influential circles. One. Uh, number two, uh, I think what Mars One, for example, has done, and I told Boss this yesterday, uh, is to provoke a debate among the citizen people, us, about going to Mars and colonizing it. And so there's now kind of a phone in out there. If this is not a top-down presidential directive like Apollo. This is people amongst ourselves saying, you know, it might be kind of interesting to go 
Mars. They asked the, I did an interview the other day with some British journal that asked me about Mars One. They said, would you go? I said, well, I can take my guitar with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I think societies like you know, the, the Mars Society, Planetary Society, professional groups like the Geophysical Union and the American Astronomical Society and so forth, all play a role. And what we found in pushing back on the budget cuts was that you need an integrated, consistent approach that is coordinated. If you get, you know, we had all the leads of the major professional organizations write a letter together, and that carried some weight when they got to Capitol Hill. They said, well, you know, maybe we've done the wrong thing. And that uh, resulted in budget restoration. So this is how these things work. It takes a lot of effort and coordination, but I think it's, it's possible. So again, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, the offer to be here.